Good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Dean of the College of Architecture and the Arts, Judith Kirshner, who should be arriving shortly, and myself, welcome to the School of Architecture and the opening lecture of the 2008-2009 series. Before getting to the main event, two quick announcements. Next week, uh, the lecture will be on Monday, on the 22nd, Jose Uberi, uh, followed by, we hope, Sanford Quinter on Wednesday, the 24th. But you should keep your eye out uh, because Sanford is brilliantly unreliable, um, as all his friends here know. Uh, who won? Yes, he did too. It's a, it's a retrospective series. Yeah, he, yeah, he's, he's, on the right he's coming back, he's going to be here in three more weeks. Uh, we went from 14 years to one year, now three weeks is the next increment. <laughs> um, all right. Hello, Judah, thank you for saving me. Um, I'll mute it right now. Good evening. As I was saying, rim up on. Had a long night ahead of us. Who we can always depend on for his hijinks and shenanigans uh, is our guest tonight, Peter Eisen. For almost half a century, Eisenman has been the center of advanced architectural discussion, design, and pedagogy in America. The calm eye and the storm he has consistently generated around himself, Hurricane Peter. <laughs> Starting out, unremarkably enough, uh, just another regular gap tooth kid from New Jersey, uh, with a BR from Cornell and an MR from Columbia, Peter took the fateful and rather odd course, especially at that time in 1960, to go to the University of Cambridge to undertake a PhD under the guidance of Leslie Martin, Sandy Wilson, and most notably Colin Rowe, the result of which was Peter's 1963 dissertation, The Formal Basis of Modern Architecture. And the rest, as they say, is history. When returning to the U.S., Peter began teaching at Princeton and co-founded CASE, the Conference of Architects for the Study of the Environment, and it was at the third meeting of that group in 1969 at MoMA that five architects were launched. Um, on leaving his position at Princeton in 1960, he founded the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies, the IAUS, uh, acting as its director and founding editor of its major journal, Oppositions, from 1973 to 1982. That journal, the appearance of which can't be overestimated uh, in terms of what would come after and what we are all relying on, introduced major European figures and debates to an American audience for the first time, and was modeled after earlier avant-garde magazines, small magazines, uh, of which Peter had been an avid collector uh, and connoisseur. After stepping down from the Institute and founding his own professional office in 1982, he won his first major competition, almost right out the bat, for the Wexner Center of the Visual Arts in Columbus, and then there would follow an avalanche of groundbreaking institutional projects from the Columbus Convention Center, to the Arnoff Center in Cincinnati, to the more recent range of counter-spectacular spectacles, including the stadium for the Arizona, Arizona Cardinals in Phoenix, the monument for the murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin, and the ongoing city of Galicia, the city of culture in Galicia, Spain, images from which uh, Peter will share this evening later. Despite the extent of this recent built work, Peter has only accelerated his publication and production and just in the last few years, his long-anticipated tour de force study of Giuseppe Tirani has appeared, as well as two volumes of collected essays, the dissertation facsimile from 1963, and just a few months ago, ten canonical buildings, which collect the arguments developed in a series of seminars at Princeton and Yale, and contribute to his extended lessons on close readings of post-war architecture. Regardless of whether you agree or disagree with the arguments, and Peter is a great sponsor of people who disagree with him as much as he is, uh, more than he is of people that agree with him, like or dislike the design, any person, and then for, therefore I hope all of us, who consider architecture to be first and foremost a cultural practice or an intellectual discipline or an ideological endeavor, find an ally in Peter. 
His version has been a relentless focus on the discipline of architecture as a kind of writing, in part as a way to make architecture finally modernist, against which he presents the secret humanism or classicism of the early 20th century so-called modern architecture. So really to make architecture modernist, um, whereas the other earlier arts in the early 20s had been modernist, architecture, he says, wasn't, and that his project in some sense has been to uh, make architecture finally mod modernist, meaning to reorient the relationship of subject to object. But for all of this significant Sturm and Drang, on the autonomy or the interiority of the discipline and its need for close attention and formal discrimination, Peter has been perhaps under-recognized for being an incredible institution builder, which is in the end a political task. From case to the IAUS, oppositions to the ENI series, Peter is a one-man cultural front for architecture, a sponsor and instigator for several generations of architects, historians, critics, and general audiences for the field, an active promoter of debates and intellectual skirmishes with a range of would-be opponents from Chris Alexander and Robert Venturi uh, to more recently Leon Creer and Rem Kulhas. In terms of local history, it should not go without mention that from 1988 to 1993, Peter served as a Lily Sullivan Chair in Architecture here at UIC at the invitation of then-director Stanley Tigerman. In one studio Peter did in 1990, while his office was working on the Repstock Park project for uh, Frankfurt, uh, the technique of folding was first introduced to architecture, again demonstrating the potential impact and significance when a theoretically engaged office can operate in the context of an experimental school environment as had been set up under Stanley. As Stanley gave the inaugural lecture last year, there was no one more appropriate to give the inaugural lecture this year than Peter, and I'm grateful for his generous willingness to play along. <laughs> Pro bono, it should be noted, uh, <laughs> as well as the return of Stanley and Margaret tonight. Uh, for Peter, architecture is a contact sport, and he's engaged it in that way, heroically, tragically, and comically, for 50 years, emerging as very likely the last great hope for the kind of volubility and generosity in our time. And for that alone, we can forgive him the prank calls at 6 a.m. in one of his funny character voices. Uh, so board up your windows and please join me in welcoming finally back to the ANA, the hurricane, Peter Eisenberg. Um, Robert, thank you. Uh, that's a very gracious introduction. Given our history, you have to. What he left out was that um, I shepherded him through uh, three years of his first teaching here, and um, but I won't go any further than that. Uh, just to say, there were other sidelights in the teaching venue that uh, interested Robert, but uh, in order not to embarrass anybody before we begin, we just. Be I'm trying to funny character voices. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, mean, I am in my money character voice. <laughs> I, I also want to thank Stanley and Margaret, uh, Margaret McCurry and Stanley Tigerman, who uh, uh, introduced me to my now wife, got me off my wayward ways, uh, and married me in Chicago. So I, I thank you for the fact that I'm still married after 18 years, uh, a model that uh, my daughter who's now marrying for the third time, says, well, uh, hey, what kind of, you can't say anything. I mean, you know, you were married three times. Stanley's been married three times. Everybody I know has been married three times. I said, yeah, I waited a little longer than you. But in any case, uh, I'm, I'm, I think, less dangerous now <laughs> as I approach puberty. But... Uh, <laughs> In any case, um, I had said to Bob when I read this, which I, I don't really like reading student magazines, especially ones that you can't read because the printing is so small, but there was a, a couple of lines in this magazine that really agitated me. And I, I was the one that uh, called Bob and said, look, I'm willing to come for dinner. Uh, I want to talk. And I want to give an open letter 
to Bob Sumner. That was my intention, and in fact, I have written here uh, an open letter to Bob Sumner. Okay? It's there. And then I said, you know, why play with Sarah Palin? Uh, you know, I don't want to do that. Right? Just ignore her. Right? And, uh, so, you know, why get all head up with Bob Sumner? You know, why not just give the lecture you want to give? So, I'm not going to do Sarah or Bob. I'm going to do Peter tonight. Uh, probably I knew I was going to do that all along. Uh, and so, if I stumble a few times uh, away from my prepared text, uh, I can leave you the, the open letter to Bob Sumner. Uh, because actually, when I did finally read it over, None of you would get it anyway, because it's a private uh, discussion, but I will leave it for you since it, uh, you, you can publish it in the uh, In any case, um, I want to do a three-part quick, uh, we'll do it in an hour. I want to do 15 minutes on what I want to talk about, 15 minutes on why Bob Sumner is misguided, uh, uh, 15 minutes on a project we're doing in Spain. The only reason I'm going to show you the slides in Spain, because I know everybody's supposed to show images, uh, that's what architects are supposed to do. Uh, I have never seen uh, these, they just came in the office, they seem to look good on um, little things, so I'm anxious to see them myself. So I'm actually going to watch with you. Uh, when we, we show these pics. Uh, so this is the first shot at this. Uh, this is my tryout for the fall uh, run of, of lectures. Um, and so this is uh, unrehearsed, and here we go. Now, you're not gonna probably get what I'm interested in, and it doesn't matter. You're here, just enjoy being here, and don't worry about what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the metaphysical problem. And for me, the metaphysical problem uh, is, is a very real one. Uh, and it's a real one because the philosopher Jacques Derrida said to me when we were working together that architecture was the locus of the metaphysics of presence. Now, uh, what Jacques meant was that what seems to be the relationship between the signifier and the signified is very obvious in architecture because it's always present, whereas the relationship between signifier and signified in other discourses uh, are not as clear. And his critique uh, of linguistic philosophers, such as de Saussure, of Foucault, uh, of Heidegger and others, was that they missed the metaphysical problem. And what I will argue is that for five centuries, we have uh, been sustained in architecture by the metaphysics of presence. And, um, and when somebody tells me that architecture is the locus of the metaphysics of presence, that's when I want to try and tear down the argument. Now, what is meant by the metaphysics of presence? The metaphysics of presence assumes that when I'm speaking as I speak in signifiers to you as receiving meaning or signified, that that communication is clear if we are English speaking, we are uh, understand the, the language, we understand the culture from which it is said, that that understanding is clear and direct. That's what is known as the metaphysics of presence. That is, we have to uh, be here with you and I together. Now, that's the same thing with architecture. We look at architecture. We are present in architecture. We uh, assume that what we see is truthful. That is, when we look at a column uh, and the building is standing up, we know that not only is it a column, but it is the sign of a column. So it is a signifier and a signified at the same time. That's why uh, Jacques Derrida argued 
that since that was always the case, uh, architecture is that real center of this problem of presence. That is, we assume what we see to be truthful. Now, I've spent the last 20 years uh, critiquing that project, uh, and I don't have an answer for it, but to me, it is one of the last remaining problems in architecture. That is, architects, philosophers, uh, social critics, and others assume that what we see, that is, the preeminence of sight, uh, is what determines truth in architecture. Uh, and we are, as it were, uh, assume that from the fact that we are always looking and seeing things and we assume that those things that we see have meaning, that is, they are truthful unto what they purport to be. Derrida's critique in 1968 and of grammatology of all previous linguistic strategies was that that uh, assumption of truth in presence is a fallacy and has been a fallacy in Western so thought since it was first proposed in the 16th century. Uh, and this was a devastating critique that he leveled at the, the whole underpinning of Western thought that was first articulated, let's say, in the 18th century by Kant and then by Hegel, then by Heidegger and others uh, who have followed through. And what we don't realize is that the way we're taught and the way we think as architects is precisely that. As Bob Sommel said to me, you know, I understand your critique, uh, but what does it look like? And of course, that's the whole problem, is we shouldn't be asking the question, what does it look like? Because that's where the problem lies, that it looks like something. And so, for me, one of the problematics is the question of what does something look like? Now, in architecture, when we're in a studio environment, we are, first and foremost, uh, trying to make something that looks like something. So we are always asked, what does it mean? Our critics ask us, what does something mean? If, in fact, you were to answer a critic, it means nothing. Or it means whatever you want it to mean, you'd be thrown out of the studio. So that meaning is one of the didactic, uh, important conditions of what you're trying to do in a studio. The second thing that you are trying to do is to make meaning or uh, functioning of your building clear. Uh, so that the after the question, what does it mean or why does the facade look like it does? The second thing is, could you take me through the plan? Uh, could you show me the, how the plan works? Where is the front door? Is it clearly marked? Uh, how do I get to the stairs? How do I get to the public rooms, to the private rooms, etc.? Does it work as a part to whole relationship? Now, the part to whole relationship is one of the underpinnings of the metaphysical project because the metaphysics of truth means that the parts must relate to the whole. And we have been taught ever since the uh, Alberti said in the 15th century, a house is a small city, a city is a large house, that there is an inevitable relationship between a house and a city, between a room and a house. As Rietveld said, in my chair is the idea for a house, in my house is the idea for a city. So the metaphysical project, that is, of the part relating to the whole, has always been a constituent aspect of what we have been taught. Part of the problem today is that we have new tools that allow us uh, an enormous liberty. Those new tools like Maya, Rhino, 3D Studio, uh, the Photoshop, uh, etc., allow us to produce an enormous range of things. What's interesting is that what has happened is that my argument, in a sense, has been turned on its head by this, because at a recent jury at Harvard, uh, a student got up and said, uh, I've spent a whole year on my thesis project, 
I've produced a fabulous algorithm. And he showed us his algorithm. I wouldn't know uh, a good algorithm from a bad algorithm if I fell over it, right? And he said, what I can do with this algorithm is produce in an infinite variability of form, right? And I'll show you. And then he proceeds to array a series of forms. They all look like what people produce on Maya and Rhino. They're these chicken coops, punctured uh, chicken coop uh, projects. And so I said, gee, that's really interesting. Um, I've seen one of these before, but that's part of infinite variability. I said, how do you choose? He said, choices of no problem. Choose anyone you want. And I said, okay. And I said, what if I choose X over Y? How does it mean anything to anybody? And he said, oh, it doesn't have any meaning. Its meaning is related to the algorithm. And I said, you mean whatever form I produce, whether it looks like a chicken coop, or it looks like an ice cream cone or whatever, uh, it has no meaning to anybody reading it. It only relates to the algorithm. <clears throat> he said, that's true. I said, my God. I said, you sound like me only in reverse uh, because I'm searching for the lack of meaning. And here you've produced a situation where there is no possibility of an icon existing because first of all, it's infinitely variable. Uh, and so I said, well, uh, number one, there's no choice, and number two, it has no meaning. So that's right. So then I asked probably the dumbest question that I could ever ask, because I was really floored by this work. I said, what's its function? Now, any of you that know me know that I haven't been very interested in function uh, in all my life. But anyway, <laughs> there was this extraordinary, virtuous, chicken coop, you know, um, and I thought to myself, well, clearly it's not for chickens, uh, and just because it looked like a chicken coop, uh, it wasn't a duck in Bob Venturi's terms. So the student replied with an absolutely straight face, it's a golf driving range. I said, a golf driving range, I said, and, and how come it's a golf driving range? I said, because that's what I decided to make. Uh, and I said, uh-huh. I said, I guess so. So you have what you find in the situation that we're in today, almost a nihilism of possibilities. That is, the tools that we have have taken us to such a limit that <clears throat> we have uh, a, 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 a capacity to what I call perform at the nth degree. That is, infinite variability, or x minus 1 variability, gives us performance tools. Now I want to jump and say, the problem is that we're all today interested in performance. Uh, I am performing here tonight. Uh, we are all in media, our media, our candidates, for president and high office are all performers. They're coached about uh, how to deal with media, etc. They can't really say what's on their mind uh, because uh, that would ruin the performance. It's a, like an actor on a stage. So that performance has taken over architecture in a way where composition uh, is relatively unimportant. And that is, what do students want to know? When I teach a graduate studio at Yale, uh, my students say, what we want to learn is, we want to learn how to do Zaha Hadid. Learn how to do Zaha Hadid. I don't know how to do Zaha Hadid. Uh, I can't do Zaha Hadid. But I, I can't teach it because I don't know what it is. Uh, but a lot of people want to do that. Some people want to do Herzog and Demeron, but they all want to know how to perform at this level of media performance. And I said, well, why don't we start with Palladio? And they all look, eh, Palladio, that's not going to help us get a job. That's not going to help us get in magazines. That's not going to help us do anything, right? Why do we need to know Palladio? And this is the, 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 the psyche that we, you all, have been raised in, in the sense 
that you are creatures of media. You are media subjects and you are fascinated by the fact of the extraordinary range of performance you can get. It's very much like when I was growing up, there was a man by the name of George Shearing who played an electronic keyboard. And to hear George Shearing on the electronic keyboard in the 19, late 1940s and early 50s was like listening to mag magic. And then came the electronic uh, guitar, and it was like magic. And then there was the synthesizer, and it was like magic in terms of, and then there was the <laughs> media spectacular that uh, you go to a concert, you're not at a concert, you're at a performance uh, where you can rarely hear the music. Uh, and if you wanted to hear the music, that's not the purpose of being at this spectacular condition. So that we have become so mediated <clears throat> that the people who were incredible artists who started with these new tools uh, started from a background of composition rather than performance. What I believe will happen eventually is that there will be a generation, they, maybe they're in the audience tonight, of people who will realize that performance, to perform differently, that is to break through in performance, requires some other skill sets. And that skill set is to know what I call the persistencies of architecture, whether it be to know what a corner is, uh, to know what a parti is, to know what poche is, to know what a plan is, uh, to know all of these things that then can be manipulated because they are unique to a discipline. There are no corners in painting. There are no corners in music. There are very few corners in sculpture. Uh, there are corners in architecture, both inside corners and outside corners. Mies van der Rohe spent a whole lifetime of work uh, studying the interior and exterior corner. Uh, and you could do a whole history of Mies look at nothing but the corner. Now, we're saying we have a whole set of new tools and uh, I've written a piece called There Are No Corners After Derrida because I think the corner no longer exists as an architectural problematic. So, in order to understand what that means, you have to understand what the corner meant and how we have to change our thinking to say, if in fact a corner is not important, then what replaces it? Or why is it not important? In order to do that, you don't study performance, you study composition. And to me, the idea of composition has to return because of the excess of tools that we have that have no legitimacy in our discipline. That is, Rhino, Maya, and the algorithms that we use to produce variable form have no basis in our discipline. And if in fact our discipline is unique, autonomous, if it has a unique locus of a metaphysical project, that is the signifier and signified being simultaneously present, then not only do we have to uh, dis, uh, disengage that problem of the metaphysic, but we have to disengage it through understanding the idea of the history of how it became engaged and so that we can in fact disengage it. We cannot learn to do that through performance alone. I would argue that uh, the big, uh, and I'm going to jump from that discourse for a minute to the discourse with Robert Sommel. Uh, one, I don't think Sommel believes that the metaphysical project, because he denigrates any linguistic project, as it were, uh, as being, we've done that already, uh, that the metaphysical project exists for him, or the metaphysical uh, discourse that existed uh, in the uh, 1960s that has been uh, undercut by uh, post-structuralism uh, is a problem for architecture. That's number one. 
Number two, I believe that uh, Robert still uh, believes, as written in this article, that part to whole relationships are important. Uh, in fact, you say that in there. Uh, that uh, the notion of performance takes precedence uh, over uh, the notion of composition. And uh, Robert is hung up, as far as I'm concerned, on this problem of the critical, post-critical, projective uh, phenomena. And uh, between uh, the commercial and the critical, which he says that the commercial has, in a sense, uh, superseded uh, the critical. And now, number one, that's a dialectical mode, which again is under question in the metaphysical projects. And so Robert's arguments, I always find, are dialectical. Number two, and I'm condensing uh, all of this quickly. Uh, I, I mean, you're. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But that's what I'm, you know, hoping for, right? We're only going for electoral votes. Uh, the uh, it's all written down here. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing uh, from the writing that the commercial, the success of the commercial, is based in the success of performance. Uh, and so we are talking now again about a project where uh, it's nothing to do with the critical, it's to do with the relationship between performance and uh, what I would call uh, composition. The final thing that really stirred me in Robert's piece uh, was the dialectical array between what and wow. And, uh, he is uh, suggesting that this dialectical relationship has to do with a hierarchical relationship between the two. Uh, and he says that Peter Eisenman is a first a wow, and ultimately, hierarchically, a what? And he's saying, whereas Rem Koolhaas uh, is a uh, what first, and then a what? And he said, and of course, uh, for performance, wow is the important issue, not what. Now, I would argue with Robert in saying that uh, I think his dialectical pairs are problematic. Uh, clearly, he uh, is not interested, as I am, in post-structuralism, where those kinds of relationships of what was first and second, the uh, hierarchy between first and second, is unimportant, but I would argue, if anything, that Rem's architecture is wow-wow, and uh, my architecture is, if anything, what-what. Uh, and maybe my architecture is uh, what-why or why-what, but it's certainly not wow-wow. Uh, now, uh, because if it were really wow-wow, uh, I wouldn't be here tonight doing pro bono work uh, <laughs> to try and get Rem Koolhaas to do that, uh, and you'll see what happens. So, uh, the wow-wows ain't here, right? Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, that's just a, a caution, cautionary uh, note. Uh, that, uh, you know, I could uh, further uh, unfed, wrap this condition, but I would argue that <clears throat> dialectics, part to whole, and these kinds of things are uh, important to the Somal argument. The last point I want to make uh, before we look at the slides is uh, I want to introduce a concept of lateness, and also one of, of Robert's pet ideas is communication, that what architecture is about is communicating. Now, lateness is a condition of, of time, not only time of a personal career, but time of a moment in time, where the new is impossible. That is, where it is impossible to think the new. And uh, I would recommend all of you uh, to a book of lateness. Uh, first of all, 
uh, Edward Said's uh, book on late style. Uh, secondly, Theodora Adorno's book on late style, uh, where they talk about what it means to be in a moment of lateness. And what it means to be in a moment of lateness is where the new is impossible and the old has already been critiqued. So that there's a moment of time and aporia where it is impossible to go forward. It's impossible to use what has already been critiqued in back. But what is interesting is that you can work on uh, the problematic of communication. And what Said and Adorno both cite is number one, Beethoven's late work. Not only it occurs in his late period of his own work, but in a late moment in history. Uh, and he says that the Misa Solemnis, for example, they both argue, that is totally uncharacteristic of Beethoven's style. And it is, when people first heard it, they couldn't understand it as music. Uh, they couldn't understand how its tonality, uh, phasing uh, movements were related to earlier Beethoven. The same thing happens with his late concertos. So that the idea of communication wasn't important, but a way of finding a potential other condition in the work. Manfredo Tafuri talks about this in the late work of Jacopo Sansovino in Venice when he talks about the Italian term sprezzatura. And the sprezzatura means uh, that it's communicating but unseen. That is, uh, not able to know. Only the initiated can understand the work. This is a characteristic of late style. And of course, certainly, the computer algorithm where only the people who know uh, the algorithm uh, is a very uh, perfect example of sprezzatura. You cannot help all of you being in a moment of late style, but you can also understand, and you can't be avant-garde, because the digital revolution wasn't a revolution. It merely produced a condition, more of the condition of lateness than we together would be willing uh, to realize. I would ask you to look at a work of literature, which I think is very important for uh, this audience, particular today, and that is Thomas Pynchon's book, Against the Day. Now, of course, that's a strange uh, title, uh, against light, against clarity, for darkness, the unconscious, etc. Where is Against the Day set? It's a set in Chicago in 1893 at the Great White City, and which was supposed to be a hope for the future, but was really a late moment in time as it turned out. And what the whole thing that Pynchon is writing about is the fair as a metonymy for lateness. Not only a lateness uh, in his book, but a lateness in literary thought. And I think it's important to understand in the history of Chicago this idea of uh, the great white city as a metonymy for the idea that I fi we find ourselves in today of an idea of lateness. There is, by the way, I have more flushed out argument of that in the last issue of Threshold is uh, an article that I contributed on the notion of late style. So uh, we have the question of the metaphysics of presence. We have the discourse of Robert Sommel. We have the issue of lateness as three a three-part uh, structure to uh, the uh, discourse so far. The last part, I want to show you the project of Santiago de Compostela. I think it is a project of lateness, um, of my own late style, since I am approaching an age where lateness is a factor. Uh, it may be too late, uh, one doesn't know, uh, although I'm never certain of that. 
in any case, it's the largest project that we have, not in terms of, of square footage uh, and in terms of, of, of cost, but uh, in terms of the, the scope of the endeavor. It's a six project, six buildings, uh, complex in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. It was won in 1999 as a competition against uh, some of your favorite architects, Jean Nouvel, Ram Koolhaas, Danny Liebeskin, Stephen Hall, etc. It was a big international comp competition and we were very fortunate to win it uh, because we played a game knowing what our competitors would do, we did perhaps what they wouldn't expect. And that was, the, I think, one of the reasons that we won. The second reason I think we won was that Galicia, which is in the northwest corner of Spain, the very poor, uh, formerly agricultural region, uh, region uh, receives a lot of its money from uh, the European Union, uh, wanted something to attract uh, tourists other than pilgrims uh, because they get annually one to two million pilgrims <clears throat> a year. They wanted lay tourists, secular tourists, and uh, like Bilbao, they wanted uh, their own Bilbao, uh, the Bil their Bilbao effect. And so they didn't want something that was like Bilbao, they wanted something that was totally uh, opposite to that. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, the competition. I'm going to show you the stages the project has gone through. We're now nine years on. Uh, we're finished one building. Two more are scheduled to be finished next spring. Uh, we've just started the last one of the six. Uh, and uh, given the fact that we're talking about a $750 million project, uh, you can understand why in a very poor area of Spain, it might take that long. Um, it's uh, a project that has gone through several political uh, changes and politics plays an enormous role in Europe as opposed to the United States. It, the same thing happened to us in Germany when uh, Helmut Kohl of the CDU lost to Gerhard Schroeder, uh, our project was stopped. And this project, uh, when the PP, the Partido Popular, lost to the PSOE, the Socialist Party, uh, in, in Spain and in uh, Santiago, uh, we, uh, our project was stopped. And so uh, politics uh, and you are intimately involved with uh, architecture, uh, unlike this country where uh, I don't recall a president uh, ever having commissioned uh, an important building, except if you think of George Bush and Bob Stern's uh, library project, uh, which I'm assuming is going to be a very important building. Uh, I work for Bob Stern, so remember I said that. Uh, you heard it here first. Uh, anyway, let's go and look at some pics. That's what I'm here. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, the first project, what we started with was a project which we call a you know, of difference. In other words, we're talking about uh, cultural artifacts that both engage in a certain way and differentiate themselves from uh, their environment. And so we looked at a series of, of these kinds of projects. Parthenon was the first. Uh, the Alhambra, uh, the, well, I can't point it, but the Alhambra is that uh, square building with the circular center. Uh, the first palace of Charles V. Uh, you can see it better here, uh, of uh, 1527, that's uh, before Michelangelo's uh, project here for the Campidoglio, which is 1546, uh, which is again a project of uh, both containment 
of, of an, an organization of buildings and also separate from the rest of the city. So, in other words, the parts related to the whole internally but not to externally to the external environment. Uh, Escorial is another example where the parts internally operate uh, together, uh, axial symmetry, uh, hierarchy of shape and, and function. Uh, 1562, uh, a very important project uh, in Spain. Then you get uh, another kind of development that occurs in the um, uh, late 19th century, which I think is, is important to notice the difference, and that is the Hofburg in Vienna, uh, where I'm taking my students next week, because the Hofburg is an, an example of a project that begins with a symmetry and then takes on other uh, important uh, axes, uh, there's an axes down the center, there's one uh, with the gate uh, on the side, there are additions made, and so that uh, the part to whole relationship which uh, began uh, in the condition of its lateness, that is in the late 19th century, uh, becomes something else. And the last uh, project of an agglomeration which is parts no longer uh, relating to the whole um, is uh, Richard Meyer's uh, Getty Center. So uh, there is this history of these kinds of places that are apart, uh, symbolic apartness, and yes, yet uh, attempt to be something that relates to the whole. Here is the uh, first picture of the um, site as, uh, well, the first picture. The site as it exists uh, today, uh, it's on a mountainside uh, outside of, of Galit, uh, outside of Santiago. Uh, you get an idea of the scale of the project. That round building on the upper right is an arena for about 13,000 people. So the buildings that you see uh, are, are quite large, about a million and a half uh, square feet under cover. As you start from the left-hand side, is a archive building, then the large building with the stripes on it is a library building. The building under construction in the middle is an opera house and another museum opposite. And then a research center to the upper right and a history museum on the upper uh, left. These uh, come out of ideas uh, internally and externally. This is the Wren Library at Trinity College in Cambridge and the library that we're doing um, in uh, uh, large-scale public spaces. Uh, this is uh, Brunelleschi's uh, Santo Spirito in Florence, which always the, the play of the red against the gray and the white uh, were always something very important to me and we're using a similar kind of uh, floor patterning. Uh, the arcades of, of Santiago and our arcades, the uh, tile roofs, and it's the first building we've ever done which is completely done in local stone, so much so that all of the roofs are, uh, the stone roofs that you see are, are 10 feet above the actual roof so that none of the stacks and exhausts and, and chases and things that you might see on a normal roof uh, will show. Uh, which was very important uh, to us. Uh, the local stone, as you can see from our stone facade below and the stone facade of the houses, uh, the floor, the paving on the uh, main square. And one of the things important in Santiago, because it rains a lot, is the, uh, the fact that the glass uh, balconies uh, overhang and are mainly of glass and you see that same kind of overhang in the articulation of the facade of the uh, archive building. And then in La Coruña, the main port of, of Santiago, the sort of myriad the complexity of the glass facades and the uh, complexity of the facades in glass that uh, we are working on. So all of these things came out of, uh, not in retrospect, but 
uh, the way we uh, attempted to work with the building. The first model which won us the competition is the slide on the uh, left, which is the hillside uh, which we took off and then rebuilt as buildings so that the, the project is, comes right out of the hillside. And don't ask me about the diagram on the right because that requires a, a whole other explanation which I'm not prepared to uh, discuss. I probably can't even remember what the hell those lines are, uh, but they were certainly important at the time. Uh, but nine years ago, it could be anything. It could be an algorithm that I... Uh, it's a chicken coop. It doesn't look like a chicken coop. And um, all I can tell you about these drawings uh, they were very important to us, but what they are is an upper left is the actual town of, of Santiago uh, uh, applied to uh, the hillside, the plan. The second is the distortion uh, topographically, uh, and that is the actual physical distortion of the, of the place. And then the third is the uh, computer algorithms distortion so that we have a, a uh, as it were, a natural distortion, a medieval distortion, and then a contemporary distortion as they figure through the top three uh, drawings. This is a site plan of the project starting at the bottom. Uh, you can see the archive building, the library, you see the opera house with its uh, three thrust stage, a big uh, four-part stage, uh, the two museum buildings on the left and the archive, uh, I mean the study center building on the right, uh, and the medieval roots that uh, run through the project. And here you can see what we were talking about, the hillside, this is a, a, a shot from the uh, downtown Santiago as you're going to go up the hill, and the building coming uh, right out when it will be finished right out of the hillside. So it completes the hillside. You notice the two towers on the right uh, were an homage to a, a friend, a, a very close friend and colleague, John Haydock, uh, who uh, had done a project for Santiago. He was an ardent Catholic and uh, had written a book of poems and had designed this uh, cathedral body as it were, I mean, cathedral facade without a body. That is the disembodied cathedral, and these are the west facade towers. And uh, on his deathbed, I promised John that I would build these towers for him in Santiago, and we built them first. And what's really wonderful about where they're located is if you go through on the other side and look back to the town, the two uh, towers frame the uh, cathedral tower. Uh, lucky accident or uh, divine uh, intervention, I don't know. Um, the <clears throat> uh, building on the left is the History Museum and on the right uh, the um, Study Center building. Uh, again, a picture of the History Museum, that's all you can see the roof is there and the, they're starting to build the infrastructure which will uh, allow for the tile uh, roof to go on. Uh, the interior of the History Museum. This is one of my favorite shots. As you drive up, you get this the Cartesian grid, the hillside and the deformation. This thing twisting, uh, and, which to me, uh, I guess it's my sort of wow, <laughs> little lowercase wow. Uh, I mean, I'm still uh, susceptible to those kinds of things, but uh, it's only a happy accident. Uh, again, a picture from the air uh, of the th four buildings that are almost finished, and you see the one in the foreground in the middle under construction. the interior of the library building. And 
And yeah, that same building uh, just now, these are the new shots, uh, which uh, you can see that it's almost finished. Again, the library building. And what's interesting about uh, these spaces uh, in the library, it moves from an upper level on the upper right through to the middle level in the middle of the picture down to the repository of, of rare books. So there are three different levels and section uh, that occur uh, in this picture. Again, looking from the archive building to the library building in the near foreground and the uh, research center in the distant. <coughs> this is the uh, archive building in front, the low building, and the roof of the library behind it, which is missing its front nose, which comes down uh, to the plaza also with the tiles. And of course, what we did was to take the red it's a quartzita stone, a quartzite stone, it's a shale. Uh, and we use the red range of shale for the roofs and the white, gray, yellow range uh, for the vertical surfaces as they've done in uh, Santiago. A shot at night of the archive building. Archive. The uh, sectional drawings of the same building where these plans relate to this overall uh, series of grids um, that you can see the vectoral grid and the thick lines, the Cartesian grid, the several Cartesian grids overlaid as you can tell. Uh, certainly, uh, I don't know if it's about communication. The um, this is an actual glass floor. Uh, we fought like crazy to get it. Why, I don't know. Maybe to get this kind of a picture. But, uh, in any case, uh, this is the archive building. <laughs> I'm looking at these for the first time, so... If I stop, it's because uh, I'm fascinated with something, so excuse me. We just got these pictures last week, so. Um, again, don't ask me what the spaces are for. Uh, I don't think we know or they know. I think it's a kindergarten, actually. It's actually uh, being built superbly well. I mean, the, uh, we have local architects and engineers on the site. Uh, we have a team in Madrid working on the shop drawings. We, we check the shop drawings for aesthetic control or specificity, and, and they take them uh, for technical compliance. There's a, uh, a shot with the Hayduk, the two, the twin towers of the Hayduk uh, church without a body, a glass tower and a stone tower and the uh, archive uh, building uh, on the right. Same picture at night. And the final shot from the approach and you can see once the uh, opera building is placed in, you'll get this curve of this hillside, which is the way it was. And we cut the top of the hillside off, put the buildings in, and then uh, restoring uh, the top of the hillside. Okay, I promised that we would be done in uh, 
50 minutes or 50, 45, but uh, enough time for Robert to uh, reply or um, that was part of the game. So, uh, Fit into the dialectical process. And therefore, I think 
it's not estrangement per se, it is a way of working in a moment of time between the estrangement and the avant-garde. And uh, it is what all people have done in their late moment. That is, it's not a project of a dialectical estrangement. That's why I like it. And I would argue that's not a project of estrangement or negativity. It, 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 it is well-liked in Galicia, a very conservative. They think it's a very conservative project. One of my critiques think it's a very conservative project. So I don't think we're talking about the Walter Benjamin project of negativity, the Adornian project, the, the uh, Frankfurter Schule. I think we're talking about another issue, which I think comes in at certain moments in time, in people's career, and also in uh, the Geist of, of, of the time. And I think that Geist is no longer a Geist of the negative, and that's why I don't use the word critical, because I don't think we are, uh, and I didn't use it in my book, I used the word phenomenal, rather than progress. Yeah, we've made progress. But around you, I'm not allowed to use the word critical. So. Anyway. Uh, and I don't want you to keep banging the same drum, because you can't say, that's what I'm trying to get you off of, banging the drum against the negative project. Because I don't think that the project of today, those projects of today, are projects of negative. So, and this is a transition question to the rest of you. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about Bilbao effect versus maybe the Galicia effect. What is the, in other words, what in your techniques or composition, if that's okay. the issue, differentiate this from that? Or what are the different, either at the end of production, which is the technique, or the end of the subject's response to it? Right. I would argue that what Bilbao has done is taken all of the energy of the city and collapsed it into one moment in time. In other words, it is an, an introspective, entropic project that collects the, the life of the city into a moment in time, into one place, uh, aside from being what I call spectacular. So I, I am not, in, I, I would like to think that our building is one that reaches out to history, to the place, to the materiality, etc., and is not entropic. It's absolutely the reverse. And so I, I distinguish it from, and, it's, and for me, it's not spectacular. It's just, there it is. Uh, and so I would argue that it's very different in what it does uh, in terms of the urban fabric. In other words, what Gary does to me is to collapse, reverses the part to whole relationship, the whole relates to the part. I think that is not an issue in, in, in our project. That's not what I'm If you've ever been to Bilbao, you will know there's not much action <coughs> in that city uh, other than Bilbao. One of Peter's favorite critical uh, TV shows is The Simpsons, and his favorite one is when Frank Garrity uh, is on. <laughs> <laughs> Crumbles up the paper and says, That's it. And of course, Peter thinks that's exactly how Frank designed. So, <laughs> and it's a form of composition, I guess. But you know, I think part of it is the reading effect of, at least the attempted reading effect via the series of grids and you can't read. read. It's, it is attempted. It what? Attempts. It attempts reading, but it's, in other words, I would argue it's like we talked about the Michael Haneke film, uh, Cache into the whole film war. Uh, Caché is a, it, you think it's a whodunit, who sent them the tape, right? And it's impossible from everything that's there to figure out ultimately who sent the tape. And the whole idea is to forget, you start off thinking it's a, because the mystery is the archetypal modernist project that is finding the solution to a puzzle. Uh, you realize that in uh, Caché, doesn't work because there's no solution. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, No Country for Old Men, uh, it's a puzzle of a certain sort that I still believe has, I mean, having watched it two or three times. Uh, do, does Javier Bardem have the money or not? How does he find the guy with the white hat? 
how does he find a wife, how does he find anybody after the clicker is gone from the money. So it's not a question of uh, false plot or bad plotting. It's not about the plot. It's not about, it's about these particular vignettes that don't have any narrative, and it doesn't matter. Does he have the money? Does he get caught? Will good triumph over evil? It's, 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 it's a thing that starts to come into uh, filmmaking today. Uh, I mean, uh, there are more films that I've watched recently, uh, and then this, of course, is a Coen Brothers film, which is, you know, these guys traditionally have plot and narrative. I mean, their trilogy, Blood Simple, Lotus Crossing, and Fargo are all narrative films set, you know, where there's a, a crime and, and ultimately good prevails over evil. And um, this doesn't happen in the latest film. Uh, it doesn't happen in Michael Haneke's films. Uh, go and see Funny Games, which uh, is going to be on your Netflix list. Go uh, you see Funny Games uh, if you want to see a film that uh, is takes the genre of the horror film and, and, and places it in an East Hampton home, uh, a la Richard Meyer, Charlie Rothman, etc. It turns it into a horror show. It's uh, uh, interesting. So I think what, what's happened is that while the temptation may be to read, uh, that is, what ends up to be another what, rather than because there's no reading there. The communication is not the, the object of the exercise. That's the premise. And I think that's a premise of lateness. It's a premise of, of Thomas Pynchon's latest book. It's a premise of Michael Haneke's late work. And, you know, all you do is compare Haneke to Robert Bresson of the you know, 60s, where the same kind of whodunit uh, good and evil, uh, and it's a, it's a very different condition of, of, of filmmaking. And I think it's with the Coen brothers, uh, I think it's with Chabrol's latest film, uh, A Girl Cut in Two, I mean, uh, one could go on and on. Uh, that film has changed, literature has changed, painting has changed, and I think architecture uh, remains caught in this metaphysical mind. And Derrida would have argued with me that it won't change because it cannot get out of that truth and presence, because it is truth and presence. And the real issue is, is that in fact the truth? And that's a question that I ask all of us as architects of age, architects becoming, uh, to consider, because I think it is one of the problematics of our time. Yeah. Questions? Comments? Anything? Yes? I wonder how you, within your political positioning, arrived in a city like Berlin or a city like Santiago, and managed to go beyond this sort of cultural tourism and get back to those city sites or archives, museums, well, memorials. Let's ask, the, let me try and answer that question. First of all, I was working for Helen Cole, one of the most conservative right-wing politicians of all time. I was working for uh, uh, the last Franco minister uh, in uh, Spain, uh, who was my client. Uh, when I did the Arizona Stadium, I was working for the most conservative ownership in one of the most conservative states. When I did Cincinnati, I worked for a Republican legislature which sponsored our building. So that uh, I'm not convinced that there's any correlation necessarily between uh, the clients that I have and the work that I do, number one. I don't know whether Borromini's Pope was a right-wing or left-wing Pope. Doesn't interest me. What interests me is uh, San Carlo, uh, which is a great church. Uh, I don't know if the people liked it or didn't like it. I don't know if it's recyclable, uh, would it get a lead certificate, etc. Great architect. All I know is 
that to me, architecture and the political climate in which it operates is somehow different. Now, I was just telling Robert that we're doing invited to a competition in Munich uh, for a museum of Nazi history. How about that for a tough project, right? For the architect who did the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. Um, how do you take on that project? And that's where I think you have to separate out the cultural discourse that is operating in the project and the architectural discourse. And can the architectural discourse in some way comment upon the, the purpose of, of, the, of the work? Uh, and I believe it can. I wouldn't take on the project. Uh, if it, but uh, as Bob says, I took on Giuseppe Terragni, who did the House of the Fascists. Uh, and my analysis had nothing to do with Tarani as a fascist, fascist Italy, etc. Uh, many of my, my the great uh, Italian filmmakers came out of the fascist movement in, in Italy. Uh, Corbu was a syndicalist, uh, wanted to work for Mussolini. So uh, I think the question uh, is a very difficult one to give a, a, a single answer. I certainly don't believe uh, uh, that Manuel Fraghi Romane, who was the last Franco minister, thought of my project as a fascist project or a right-wing project. He wanted a cultural monument that would be different than what Franco did in the Valle de los Caídos, which was this memorial to the fallen, uh, sort of a cenotaph for Franco. So. Uh, Without him, we would have had no project. He's the one that picked our project, uh, and he's the one that said, this is what I want. Uh, Helmut Kohl picked our project. Um, so um, I, I don't know how to answer. Uh, to me, it's never been a problem that Tarani was a fascist, that Borromini's client was a right-wing pope, uh, that Corbu wanted to work for Mussolini. Still, Corbu's a great architect, right? Uh, so I, I don't know how to, to answer because I've never had a problem with the political uh, positioning of our clients. And I have to argue that, as I said before, there's not been one American president, uh, probably since Thomas Jefferson, uh, Republican or Democrat that was ever interested in architecture at all. But Clint was never interested in architecture. He hired Jim Culture to do his library. Um, Harry Truman wasn't interested in architecture. Jack Kennedy wasn't interested in architecture. None of them sponsored architecture. The only guy that I know that I worked for in New York City, the only person that hired me in New York City to do a project was Rudy Giuliani. Uh, I was very close to Rudy. Uh, and we were doing a very, uh, he gave us $60 million to do a, a very wild museum. It never got built because of 9-11. So what am I to do to say that uh, Rudy's politics are such? If George Bush asked me to do his library, I'd have done it, all right? Uh, no matter what I think of George Bush. And I would try to have made a commentary on his presidency by doing it. That's what I feel. Uh, the Nazi, it doesn't mean, because I'm doing a Nazi museum, it doesn't mean that I support the ideas of, of, the, of, of the regime. What I'm trying to do is to make commentary on that through architecture. I think architecture is always done. But I'll tell you, a Nazi museum is different than doing a Bush library a little bit. <laughs> Talking about uh, when you talk, when you talked about the, the performance has taken over the composition, yeah. And then you got, you got to the chicken coop idea with the, the guy to tease his project, and then I begin to wonder: Do you think like these new instruments or technologies, you know, they're quite a different way of thinking when you look at them? 
you know, like when you look when you look at like you say media and performance, you know, in order for a good performance, the choreography, which is the composition, right, is where, where does so you have the performance the, and the composition. But you we have to change how we view composition. What I'm saying is we know where performance is. What I'm saying is the compositional modes to uh, to adjust to the new tools of performance, we don't have yet. No one can tell me that they can write an architectural algorithm that will have a commentary on architecture. It may be a commentary on, on, on automobiles, it may be a commentary on boats, it may be a commentary on whatever airplanes, these algorithms, because they weren't designed for architect. architects use them. What I'm saying is until we have tools that talk about the discipline and the problematic, the unique problematic of architecture, composition will always take second to performance. That is, we know how to perform with these drugs, uh, but do we know how to compose? And that's where we are in our uh, educational system. Uh, I don't know how to teach uh, these new tools. I honestly don't. I'm absolutely uh, not able to teach uh, Maya, uh, Studio Max, uh, Rhino, etc. I don't know, you know, or teach algorithms. Can't do it. So uh, I'm the wrong person to ask. How do we, uh, in fact, find something that these tools will give us of value that we can make value decisions about which architectures you know, will reside in what I consider to be the history of architecture. I don't know what that is. So do you think we're going through a change, a phase? I moment? think we're going through an enormous change. We're not there yet. That's what I'm saying. We're in a late moment. But if we look at the work being done in lateness, which is what these algorithmic projects are, I mean, Hernan Diaz Alonso and people like this, if we start looking at what these guys are about, because they're about something, uh, totally ununderstandable to me, but uh, are, are using the tools to try and find uh, the next architecture. And I think that's where the discipline is right now. We are, we know something is coming about. I think since 9-11, uh, 2001, we are in a paradigm shift. We're not clear what that paradigm shift is, but since uh, the 1990s, the digital, supposed digital revolution, uh, we are in a paradigm shift. What the results for architecture so far uh, remain open as to their, their long-standing value. Uh, but your generation, uh, the generation that is sitting here today, have, if you, if you can understand the army of tools that you have, but they're only tools. And as Robert says, I still think you need to have an idea. We can't just make chicken coops and golf driving ranges, you know, and, and say, you know, that's architecture. Uh, the question is, what are the symbolic and cultural possibilities from the new tools, and how will they affect, uh, in, in a sense, the, the, the cultural life of our society? I can't answer that question. You all answer. Yeah, back there. I'm sorry, could you reiterate your point to architects aged and learned and becoming from just a moment ago? Uh, I had heard that you thought architecture should free itself of existence. I think I misunderstood that. But free itself of what? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> architecture should free itself of what? Of existence? Is that what you said, or am I misunderstanding that? I didn't hear the word. Of existence? Or am I misunderstanding no, existence. That? I didn't say existence. Well, um, could you go over that uh, real quick? <laughs> Persistence is the word I use. Persistence? Persistence rather than existence. That's what I use. The persistence is the word. Michael Corner. Uh, uh, used to be a persistency. People used to spend a lot of time thinking about it. I don't think it is a problem today.
way, but the question is why is it not, and what is replacing it? Uh, Warren Indy didn't think there were any corners either, uh, but they returned uh, in neoplasticism. So you've got to be very careful about when things, what things leave and what things remain. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 I just want to make sure I, I understood something clearly. You were, you were talking about like not assigning a specific pain. Could you stand up? I, I really, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's all right. Uh, you were talking about assigning, not assigning like specific means, like something that looks like something or something right. means something. Right. Um, so, what is it, what does it matter if somebody just says that's a chicken coop or that's a golf course? It matters because the idea of architecture has always been to give either iconic in the Persian sense or symbolic meaning to its forms. That is, uh, Ross and Krauss, the noted art, art historian, has always said, architecture will always mean that it can't help meaning, right? What I'm saying is, is that and there's always been a drive that there is a clarity that somebody understands this is a post office, this is an opera house, this is a house, etc. Uh, this is a ship, uh, this is a whatever. Uh, people are always trying when they see something they don't understand to give it meaning. And what the fallacy uh, of that argument is, is that architecture, even though its being and its sign, that is its signifier and signified, its meaning and its sign is together, uh, and always has been, which makes it a unique discipline. What I believe the strategy of architecture has always been an attempt to displace meaning from its being. And uh, this has been done during history in many different ways. Uh, and the, the issue is, how today do we separate looking like from the being of architecture? How is that possible to do? And of course, the algorithm is one way of doing it because uh, the chicken coop doesn't look like a chicken coop, nor does it look like an algorithm. Uh, and that's one of the energies that are driving this infinite variability, where, which leads somebody like Greg Lynn to say, that the part to whole relationship doesn't matter anymore, i.e. the metaphysical project, but it is the part which becomes the whole. It is the component which is the whole because it is no longer, there is no whole. It's an infinite variability of components. And so once you have the component, you can make any kind of whole that you want, that there is no inevitable relationship between the component and the whole. So therefore, component doesn't look like the whole, but it is a component. And the things that you make from it, and he makes chairs, he makes buildings, he makes walls, he does a lot of different things uh, from it. But his whole idea is that there's no longer the part to whole relationship. That is, the part no longer participates in or looks like the whole, i.e. the Venturi notion that you either have a duck or a decorated shed. The idea of ducks and decorated sheds, according to Lynn, doesn't uh, is not articulate in any way, shape, or form anymore. Now that's Lynn's work reading, whether I agree with it or not, is one of the critiques of the metaphysical project, uh, and his is the most articulate, and important critique that um, I've heard by a young architect. There's another young architect. Uh, named Pierre Vittorio O'Reilly, who teaches at the Verlange uh, in Milan, who has written a book called The Project of Autonomy. Uh, it's uh, published by the Buell Center at Columbia. Uh, it's an, another kind of critique where he argues that uh, uh, people like Matthias Ungers, O.M. Ungers, his Green Archipelago project uh, was the beginning of an idea where the city is not made up of cohesive parts, but in fact, what you do is, is rip the fabric of the city and leave holes in it. I like chicken coops, like Brent's project for uh, um, uh, uh, non-sonar. Uh, but uh, I think
think there's a, there are a lot of examples of uh, probes into the metaphysical project, whether it's Lynn, whether it's O'Reilly, whether it's Ungers, uh, Kulas, etc., that have been around for a while. We've never seen them as a cohesive attack on this project. Yeah. Do I have to believe that I don't have to You don't have to read it at all, no. So I have to, they are generally right. there. I have to read them. Exactly. The same with the grid in Berlin. Because it isn't the grid. When you go to the grid in Berlin, you look at it in a picture, and you see it, uh, what, what it is as an abstract grid. When you're there phenomenologically, it works in a very different way. The sound is different. Uh, the, the ground goes up and down. You can't stand straight. You're tight against the concrete. Uh, you run into people, uh, there are all kinds of things that happen to your experience in that particular grid, which is very different than reading. It has nothing to do with reading. Uh, people perform, but, but, but that's different than There's going to be some moment 
of the avant-garde. I can guarantee it. What it's going to be like, I don't know. Uh, and it isn't for me to know or to tell. Uh, but I know that we haven't had an avant-garde since 1910 uh, uh, or 1820 or 1710. So we're due uh, in the next 20 years, give or take a few years, but for all these people, uh, I'd get ready if I were there. I wouldn't worry about performance, uh, but I'd be worried about learning about my discipline so that when the next moment arose, I would know. Thank you very much.